We have today with us Dr. Jacqueline Woolley, and welcome to In the Experts Chair. We're very pleased to have you. Thank you. Um, so let's get, get straight into the questions. I mean, it, I think what's interesting to me about your research is it's, it, it seems, in, at first blush, it seems obvious. Well, of course, there's differences between unreal things and unreal things. But then when you get into it, you think, well, how is it? How is it obvious? How do we get to the state of, of changing, going from something that is real to something that, that determining whether something is real or, or not real. And, and I think this is a really uh, interest, interesting issue because we, we must be doing it all the time. This is this something that adults do as well as children? Who, who, does, who has to make this decision? Right, right. It's not just a child problem. It's something that adults have to deal with all the time. We always have to be aware of what's real and what's not real. For example, if you didn't know whether you were dreaming or really here today, that would be problematic. So we have to be able to make that distinction in order to function normally in our world. So it's not just a child problem. Well, uh, but, um, but, uh, so so you, you do studies of this, mm -hmm. but it must be particularly hard for children, right? Because they are being presented with things all of the time, mm -hmm. some of which are re real, but many of which are not real, and many of which are kind right. of real. Right. So they must be very, live in a confusing right. world. They really do. I mean, reality and fantasy are seamlessly interwoven in all facets of their lives. So for example, you can imagine a child watching Sesame Street in which they're being taught about science by a monster. Mm -hmm. How do you know what to believe? You read a book about a little girl who flies away on a swan. How do you know which aspects of the book are real? Which aspects represent reality and which aspects are just fantasy? So it's a very difficult question, especially with, uh, with regard to Santa Claus, for example. Mm -hmm. Santa Claus is a fictional being. I, I just need to interrupt you for now. For those of you who don't oh. know, um, I hope I didn't spoil anything. Santa Claus is not real. <laughs> All right, go back. Uh, those of you, while you're getting over it. Yeah. Um, right, so, so but, but he's presented as being real by children's parents whom they've learned to trust through this attachment process. Um, he, if children receive evidence that he's real in the form of half-eaten cookies left out by the, they receive presents signed by Santa Claus. Um, and despite all of the things that Santa Claus does that contradict what children know to be true about the world, like fat people can't fit through skinny chimneys and people can't fly through the whole world in one night, despite all of that, they still believe in Santa Claus. And part of this is because they're being provided with this evidence from, from their parents. Mm -hmm. so, 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 so what are the various components that lead somebody to say something is real or, or isn't real? Right, right. There are a lot of, what we're doing in my lab is we're looking at the different cues that children use to figure out what's real and what's not real. Uh, one cue, for example, is the context in which a child hears about something. For example, whether they hear about it from a trusted source or not an untrusted source. And again, this is a problem that adults encounter all the time. You might read about a new species of fish in the National Enquirer someday when you're waiting in line at the supermarket, or you might read about a new species of fish in National Geographic while you're waiting at the doctor's office. Presumably, in one case, you'd be more likely to believe in this kind of fish than in another. And we found that by the age of three or four, children can actually use that context. They also overhear conversations in which people talk talk about Santa Claus and other beings. And they pick up on the subtleties in those conversations. Well, that, OK. So I, I think what's really interesting uh, to me about this is, is, is that you're, is kids are surrounded by people who are essentially telling them lies all the time. I mean, so, right. uh, so par I mean, how, right? I mean, parents are always making stuff up. Right. How do they have any credibility at all? I mean, I, I don't know what percent, what, do we know what percentage of what they tell children is real and isn't real and so on? Well, it, it's a difficult question. It's a question that it's funny how common this question is among parents. Mm. I mean, perhaps even more common than where their child should go to school or whether they should even have another child is the question of should we tell our children about Santa Claus? Should we do the Santa Claus thing? Mm -hmm. Because there is this concern that children will find out and that maybe they'll think badly about their parents. They'll think that their parents were lying to them and they might never trust anything their parents say again. Um, there's actually, there's only really one study that's looked at this issue and it was actually done here at the University of Texas. And in that study they found that although for some kids there was a minor amount of disappointment, it lasted a very short period of time and for the most part kids were just fine after finding out about Santa Claus. And also there's some interesting benefits just from the whole discovery 
process of sort of feeling like you figured it out and now you're part of the adult world. So there's emotional and cognitive benefits, I would suggest, from going through this whole Santa Claus discovery process. So, but in that study with Santa Claus, I imagine when people typically discover the st they're beginning to realize the story is already breaking down and right. it doesn't make sense right. and, and you know and it's right. what if you like if you told kids who were like in full belief about mm -hmm. it and then told them Santa mm -hmm. Claus isn't real mm -hmm. what would you expect right. to see then right so you're right about that it's usually a very protracted process it's and it's very rare that your child will come up to you and say so <laughs> you know this is the big day and you have to figure out how to answer usually the child is figuring out bits all along and it takes quite a while it's an extended mm -hmm. process um, in that case in which none of that preliminary work has been done it probably is a little more traumatic mm -hmm. so uh, so tell me how do you study this in your lab it's tricky because as you know there are many senses of the word real so we really can't just walk up to kids and ask is such and such real we certainly can't walk to kids walk up to kids and ask them if Santa Claus is real. Mm -hmm. um, so what we do is we, we find a contrast that children are familiar with. And by a very young age, one and a half or so, children are pretending. And by the age of two, they know the word pretend. They're often using the word real to contrast it with pretend. So what we do in our lab is we present children with novel entities, things that they've never heard of before, like a cernet or a civet or a galah. And we ask them whether these entities are real or pretend. And so that's a contrast that they're familiar with and they're able to work with that distinction. Often we'll have them put pictures or you know, cards in boxes to keep them active. Um, but that way we can sort of vary the context in which they encounter a galah or the person who tells them about a galah or various other facets of a galah. And that way we can look to see with development whether children are using these different kinds of cues to figure out whether things are real or not real. Fascinating. And, and so how do you see this, the applications of this work? Um, well, there, there are different kinds of applications. I mean, one is just with regard to parenting and sort of decisions about the kinds of things that you want to teach your child. Um, and then also, obviously, with education, I think the process of discovering one of the things that we're looking at in our lab is the use of evidence and how do children evaluate evidence in deciding what to believe. And obviously, teaching critical thinking comes directly from that. So. And is, is what children are, by the way, I should say, if you have questions, send those in. We, we would be happy to put them to Dr. Woolley. Um, but the, the question I have is, uh, is the way kids evaluate evidence qualitatively different or quantitatively different from how we right. do it? Right, and that's, that's a good question. So in, in Piaget's model, what you, what you talked about earlier, there's a large focus on, on qualitative change, the idea that children are fundamentally different sorts of beings from adults. And what I'd suggest is that, that that's not the case, that it's more of a continuous development and that um, children, there's more of, a, more of a sort of gradual change between children and adults in these abilities, sort of gradually figuring out the pieces and, and little by little kind of, you know, the basic distinction between reality and fantasy is there quite early, probably by three. Um, and what development consists in is kind of putting everything in the right place little by little. Mm -hmm. And I would argue that we're probably not done with it yet as adults. Mm -hmm. you, you've uh, raised a question that many people are asking. What exactly is a galah? <laughs> um, you know, in our, in our work, we started out using things like cernets, which were just made up names. But we decided that it would be more educational if we presented children with novel animal names that were actually the names of real animals. Um, so a galah is one, a civet is one. Do you know what a civet is? I, have no idea. I think it is a kind of cat-like thing. Yes, that's right. You're the animal expert. And it actually eats coffee beans and excretes them. And we make very expensive coffee out of that, apparently. Sounds exquisite. So. <laughs> We've, we've got lots of these. But that way, the kids can learn about these novel animals at the end of our study. So. One other question that somebody asks is, can you tell in the brain when someone is the difference between real and pretend? Yeah, actually, um, there, there aren't a lot of study with, studies with kids. But there are actually some very interesting studies with adults showing that different parts of the brain sort of light up. In other words, different parts uh, blood goes to different parts of the brain in an fMRI scanner, for example, um, when adults are looking at and thinking about fictional beings versus when they're looking at and thinking about people that they know. So it, it may be that we're starting to identify differences in the brain. Yeah. Do, and do, do children learn the difference between um, sort of dece deception uh, tr and just sort of trying to tell you something and 
in, in a way that's maybe trying to be controlling versus playing. I was think because you were saying there's lots of pretend play. You know, animals engage in, in pretend right. play in, mm -hmm. in a sense. Mm -hmm. um, um, but so I was thinking there, there's certain things where you're telling a kid, well, if you you know if you do that, then mm -hmm. Santa Claus won't bring you any right. gifts, mm -hmm. uh, which is sort of different from pretend play right. in a way. Right, and that's sort of one way that maybe parents could handle this this issue about whether Santa Claus is real or not real is if it's difficult for you to think of yourself as telling your child a lie, if, if you really, really are pressured to thinking about Santa Claus that way, you can sort of think of it as a pretense. So, you know, we're, we're engaging in a story, we're engaging in kind of a fantasy play here, we're all in this drama together, it's fun, it's like reading a book or watching mm -hmm. a movie. Um, it's not a lie, it's a, it's a pretense. We're all kind of telling the same story. So that's, if you have trouble thinking about it, but you do want to tell your child about Santa Claus, that's kind of one way you can think about it, more as a pretense than as a lie. So what age do, if you're watching Sesame Street, at what age do they realize it's, this is not a real bird or those sorts of things? Right, or? right. It's, there's, a great, there's a great quote that I read once about Sesame Street, and a little child said, really seemed like he'd figured it out. He said, I, I, I get it, Mom. Big birds, he said, big bird's not a real bird. There's a live bird inside. Exactly. <laughs> so one of those, yeah, it's, it's again, it's a, protect, it's a protracted process. You know, by three, probably children understand that things that are inside the TV, that, are, that they see on TV aren't really little beings that are inside a box. Um, by four, they start to understand that the things that they see on TV represent things happening outside of the TV. They have a pretty good understanding of TV by the time they're five or six. Fascinating work. Can, can any of this work be applied to lie detection? Jeanette asked that question. <sighs> Not that I know. I don't know of any work that bears directly on that from this work. Um, children, again, children start to pick up on some of the kinds of cues that people give off when they're lying by a very young age. You know, by even by two or maybe younger, children will pick up on certain cues that people, you know, give off, like looking around a lot or kind of fidgeting or hesitating. So kids, kids do start to pick up on those cues at a very young age. So perhaps that's relevant. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much for, today's, for having me. being today's expert in the chair. It was a pleasure to be here. Thank you. <laughs>